All right, thank you for being here today. Uh, we have a, a fantastic topic uh, that I'm very excited to dig into uh, around the complete new, uh, view of the new consumer. Um, after a couple years of lockdown and, uh, and a variety uh, of different proliferations we're seeing around con content consumption and devices, I'm super excited about the panel that I have here today to dig into a number of topics. Uh, my name is Steve Bagdasarian. I lead growth strategy for Comscore. Um, and you know, we feel as a measurement company, we're uniquely positioned to, to really uh, unpack and unlock this opportunity with a variety of different uh, capacities in the industry. And, and I'm glad to have the representation here today. So with that, let's, uh, let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to quickly introduce themselves and to, uh, to give a little bit of a, an idea of what your role is in the organization. I would just say, uh, if you could do it in a way that you would do it walking with a stranger between the Cosmo and the Aria, <laughs> please introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit of a background on what you do. Peter, why don't we start with you? That's a long hike. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Comscore for having us all here. Uh, I'm Peter Hamilton, and uh, I head television commerce at Roku. I also uh, head our ads manager self-service products for buying CTV. And uh, I got into this uh, through a, a just crazy life, twists and turns. I started out as an opera singer. I became a startup tech entrepreneur and uh, got into streaming, and uh, Roku would have me. So super happy to be here. Glad you're here. Mike? Thanks for having me, Steve. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. I heard there's vino somewhere here. So if you have an extra cup, bring it over. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so Mike Bregman, I'm the Chief Data Officer at Havas Media Group, North America. Um, I manage a couple hundred person team that oversees data analytics at MarTech. Uh, as a media agency, we have lots of clients lucky enough to have Dana from Santa Fe here with us. So we, we do a lot of work, everything from planning to strategy to media buying. And my team typically does a lot of the measurement and optimization. I'm Dana Bargava. I lead um, experience planning at Santa Fe on the consumer health division. Um, all of the over-the-counter over products, brands you would know like Icy Hot, Asper Cream, um, Allegra, a Gold Bond. Um, I don't know how to follow an opera singer. I've kind of lit up much more <laughs> You can't tell right now. Yes. Many days of Vegas. But. Much tr more traditional <laughs> um, trajectory of starting on the media agency side, eventually going to the client side. Um, for those of you who don't know what experience planning means, because it's sort of a made-up word, um, I oversee, my team oversees the end-to-end -end experience um, for our consumers, um, everything from the top of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel, some within our direct um, directly um, that I'm directly responsible for, including media, um, et cetera, and others that we have indirect responsibility for, like retail media and shopper. Awesome. I guess I get to go last. So Larry Allen, uh, Comcast Advertising. I lead our addressable enablement data licensing business. Uh, spent a long time in the ad tech space, many startups um, doing rich media, and behavioral targeting, ad serving, et cetera. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here and have this conversation with everybody. Awesome. Again, thank you guys for being here. Uh, let's, let's start with just the realities, right? We're, we're at a unique period of time in 2023 with the state of the economy. Obviously, coming out of COVID lockdown, a lot of different behavioral shifts and content consumption shifts that we're seeing in market. Dana, I'm going to start with you to pick on you, but you know, what, are, what are you seeing? What are, what are you anticipating this year as it relates to the shifts of media, as it relates to the shifts to measurement or accountability with media uh, as we start to enter this market in 2023? Well, I think, you know, I think there's going to be, coming from the marketing side, right, there's going to be increased pressure on making sure that we're continuing to spend and optimize our money where it's actually delivering, right? And so I think, again, as we think about what my role is, which is looking at full funnel experiences and really understanding the priorities of where we're losing, it's really going to be about being very choiceful about our decisions. And if we're losing at shelf, we need to make sure we're, we're doing what we need to do at shelf, not necessarily just going to a traditional approach of spending across a full funnel, but actually prioritizing against the areas where we're losing most. And so I think it's really going to be about true prioritization. Um, and I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess that would be how I would answer that, is that it's, it's I, I don't know that necessarily there's going to be a huge shift based on the economy, but I do think it's going to be really critical to make sure that where you're spending, you're winning. Yeah. Mike, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're probably hearing this across the board from clients as well. Is it, uh, you know, any other themes there that you think pop out or anything in particular that start to stand out here? I mean, I would start off by saying we're in a golden age of MarTech right now. There's never been more companies in the space. There's never been more experimentation that's done. We specifically reserve a percentage of the budget of every campaign to do some sort of test and learn. 
The challenge is too much of a good thing becomes somewhat of a bad thing. Too many platforms, too many identity resolution technologies, too many different activation channels. There's fragmentation, and I think we, it's a moment of reckoning in the industry. Some of these companies haven't figured out how to scale. I think there's challenges in activating multi-platform, multi-screen. We can get into that in a little bit, but measurement is definitely a challenge when you have too many different, different partners that you're working with. So I think right now we're trying to figure out who are the biggest, who can scale, um, how we can help measure across the board. And uh, I think it's an interesting time for advertisers because they have to figure out who their friends are in the industry and we all have to bring it together. Oh, there's the wine. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Should make the conversation more interesting. But, but to your point around fragmentation, I mean, Larry, you know, we, we talk a lot, or obviously, you know, the, there's a the significant rise of addressability, right? We've, we've seen the proliferation of that happen within digital. You know, we're, we're really challenging kind of where the state of the TV. You know, does it help bridge fragmentation? Does it help? Does it help bring more accountability to the measurement side of it? I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing this moment in time where golden age of data, fragmentation, but it's also the rise of, of kind of the addressable strategies that are starting to emerge. Yeah, listen, we, we talk a lot about unification, right? With cross-platform, there is the fragmentation and a lot of disruption for the buyer, uh, as well as the seller, frankly. And so we're constantly looking at how do we enable our partners, the media owners, as well as our own inventory in order to cross all of those platforms and unify audiences and then measure and deliver the actual you know, outcome that, that the client needs or is desiring. Um, and that does definitely feed into measurement. We think that you know, the data that we've got partnered with, wait, thank you, partnered <laughs> with uh, you know, measurement vendors like Comscore, we think that that creates a really great opportunity for you know, clients to understand the true value of television and other digital media. Absolutely. I mean Peter, you have to have some opinions on that too within the seat of Roku, right? You know, this, this, this emergence of, of addressable data, commerce, all kind of converging and coming together. It's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity, clearly. Right. Uh, but does it, rep does it represent essentially where we're going or is it just a different version of where we've been? We're just restructuring kind of that, that opportunity. I mean, I think it all started with television anyway, so we're just coming back to do a, a full loop. If you remember, direct response started on television, uh, dial 1-800 to buy now. Uh, and then, you know, desktop had to figure out how to do direct response, and then mobile had to figure out how to do direct response. And now TV is just stealing from all of that evolution and bring, bringing it right back to the platform. CTV advertising is in early innings. Uh, you know, monetization is in very, very early days. Uh, you know, AVOD, advertising supported TV, is growing like crazy, going gangbusters. I'm not sure I would have believed that before coming to Roku, but the number one search in our search on Roku is free. People want free content, they want always on content. And so there's just going to be this enormous amount of supply and inventory that now can be targetable to the consumer and not just to the content or the context of the content. And so, again, we're stealing from what we've been able to do on desktop and mobile and bring that into a contextual experience of the user. We know a lot about our user, the Roku user, and their, their viewing habits and their behaviors and their devices and their families. And we know so much that we can use for that kind of targeting, but, um, you know, how do you make it performant? How do you drive people through a funnel? How do you do purchases? We're, you know, we're investing into that and figuring out how to drive a purchase from a mobile device directly from the television. I launched a Walmart partnership this year where you can check out on your Roku device and buy something directly from Walmart just using the remote, just press OK. Uh, we've pre-populated your payment details. Don't worry, you don't have to D-pad in your uh, credit card. Um, so, you know, those are, it's very, very early innovations there. It reminds us of T-commerce of 10 years ago, but backed by technologies that are relevant today. And we, you know, we're on that first party context, we can measure all of that, but we also want to see what does it do off of the television screen. And that means using our device IDs and using our persistent IP that's in the household to make those connections and do that attribution. and. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to prove, uh, but an enormous amount of growth opportunity. But this, this has to be challenging the way that you also think about how you're evaluating partners, specifically from a buy side angle in, but I mean, for, for all of you, right? I mean, the, the, the changes that we're seeing in market, pressure from the economy, 
There's so many different options. Everybody has an interesting story. But Pressure makes that. diamonds, man. That is true. Yeah, that's actually so all the good stuff is like going to come right now. I, mean, I, might have yeah. to, I might have to use that. With you. That's, that's, that's pretty good. But, but Dana, I mean, when, you, when you're working with Mike, when you're thinking about you know, the, 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 the options that you have in market, I mean, how, how is this changing maybe your evaluation standards so of, I think of who you very, pick? I think it's very easy to get distracted, right? It's very easy to get distracted and say, oh, well, there's so much fragmentation. And at the end of the day, right, um, we have to start with the consumer. We can't start as marketers. We right. can't start as people in ad tech and martech and say, oh, because I can do this, we should do this. We need to understand where are we losing our consumers? Where are we not meeting their needs, right? And so if we can answer those questions, and that's the homework we need to do before we talk to any of you guys, right? If we don't know our own business, we don't understand our own consumers, we don't understand wh why people are either not considering us today or or why they're purchasing our competitors, then that's, a, that's the first problem, right? So we as marketers need to know our own businesses and we need to be honest about it. Um, and we need to not blame it on things that it's not, right? And I think all of the conversation around fragmentation can get very confusing, but at the end of the day, if we know what we need to do, it makes it a lot easier to focus. That's a really, really great point. I think that like what you're speaking to is one of the major shifts more and more marketers and agencies are going to be great at interpreting first party data yeah. in ways that they didn't have to be. They just let the machine learning and algorithms of the social platforms figure out who their customers are for them. Now there's gonna be a decided shift where you have to know everything about your consumer as much as possible so that you can figure out how to do the matching in a way that those platforms can't do for you as well when there were persistent identifiers. I mean, I'll give you crazy. an example. We have two allergy products, right? And one you guys will all know about, Allegra. The other one, Zizol, which I bet you only maybe a third of you guys know about because Zizol has an awareness problem. So I can continue to push people to the bottom of the funnel hoping that I can convert them. But at the end of the day, if people don't know the product exists, it doesn't really matter how well I do the bottom of the funnel, right? And so I need to understand that for Allegra, I have to have a very different plan than I have to have for um, Zizol. For Zizol, I still need to live at the top of the funnel. I need to bring enough people in to have the chance to win with them. And I think that's, that's, that's a lot of what we need to continue to kind of, those are the questions I would ask you guys to ask the marketers when you're working with them is tell us what the real issues are on the business. Yeah, I mean, I, I would jump in and say we're, we're talking about MarTech as a paid media channel. MarTech can also be owned. There's the website, there's the CRM, there's potentially an app, there's other experiences, there's PR. There's a lot of different content that's out there. It has to work together. So when we're talking about the consumer, it's not just what they see in terms of digital advertising, it's how they live their lives and traditional market research could be one point when we talk about a funnel, yes, there's a triangle, but or a McKinsey circle, whichever you favor. But in reality, there's barriers, there's need states, there, there's different products, there's categories, there's, there's psychographics, all of that has to be taken into account when you think about what are the right touch points that consumers need in order to really get them into the consideration set for brands. It's awesome. Larry, content came up. I mean, you know, this is, the complete view of the consumer content content's core to that now, right? And there, and the, and there is there's a lot of content. There's a lot of ways to access content. Um, how, how does this play into to the, the shifts that we're seeing? Well, I mean, discoverability is important, right? For the consumer, they want to be able to get to the content that they want immediately, and so having kind of the metadata associated with the content, being able to surface on the platform so you can immediately interact and, and get to the to the show or the movie or whatever you want to watch. I think that's key. Um, it, it's interesting, I wanted to come back to kind of the thread we were on. Just in a short five years, I think the marketers have come a very long way at understanding who their consumer is. You know, five years ago I was selling data-driven advertising and I would ask brands, who is your strategic target? Who are you trying to reach? Who is buying your product? And they would look at me with like deer in headlights and they would basically say, you know, whatever, some random demo. And I was like, that can't be right, <laughs> you know? And, and so we have come a long way and the, the access that customers have now, or marketers have to their customer data uh, is, is amazing and, I'm, and we're really seeing that shift, which is awesome. It ultimately hopefully leads to a little bit more kind of cross collaboration between the buy and the sell side to be able to deliver it, but it is. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating, right? The, uh, the ability to kind of control the, uh, you know, the, the identity string, the customer relationship side of it that probably hasn't been as prevalent as it has before. You know, to that point though, I guess when you're, when you're sitting with your teams in your respective boardrooms and you're looking at the year in front of us, you're actually looking maybe, you know, 24 months is maybe too far out, 18 months is maybe the sweet spot. 
But what are, you, what are you most excited about, or what are you most fearful about, right, as it relates to, to the way that the consumer is operating today, or the way that uh, what they're consuming with is, is maybe shifting in the way that we see it today? And, you know, Mike, what, what, are, what are you guys getting excited, or what are you, what are you frustrated about there? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of ambiguity in policy. I think yeah. changes in policy, like some of the recent EU rulings for Facebook that could challenge how we collect data in the U.S. The fact that it's state by state means that we need a lot more databases, we need a lot more control. There's opt-in policies that we have to figure out. I, I'm hoping that our partners, and whether they're ID resolution or their media activation or their supply side, that they're helping us to think through a lot of those challenges. On the other hand, consumers still want some level of personalization, and we have to figure out what the one-to-many equation is in terms of targeting. I think that's an interesting math puzzle for me as a, as a data scientist and mathematician. I'm trying to figure out if one-to-one -one costs a lot of money, if the ROI is not there. Is it a one-to-100? Is it a one-to-1,000? Um, obviously, it's not one-to-a million because you want some sort of customization and, and content and marketing and targeting. So what's that right sweet spot in terms of ROI and returns? Um, I think that's another interesting thing of personalization we need to figure out. And then I think three, technology budgets are definitely going to be challenged this year not just from, from our clients, but internally for agencies. I think we have to figure out what's the right spin level that we actually want to put into R&D efforts. If we do want to test new MarTech partners, how many do we bring in if we do some sort of POCs? Who pays for it? Do we get vendors? Do we get clients? Do we pay for it internally? Yeah. There's definitely going to be a lot more scrutiny in terms of what we actually want to put in. So I think there's, there's a budgetary reckoning. I think it's an interesting time in the economy. Figure that out. Personalization, yep. privacy. It's a lot to do this year. So I, I, you, you mentioned personalization, though, and, and you know, one, one topic that just sparks on top of my head, which is you know, are, are, are the data owners, you can argue maybe on both sides of the fence, are, are, they, are they being too isolated with their data? Is there, you know, is it, in some regards, you have to be, right, for all the privacy and the compliance reasons that you have. But at the same time, too, you know, in some cases, the walls are getting bigger, uh, personalization requirements uh, are not as maybe omni-channel as we see across the board. I mean. You know, what, what's your guys' take on that? I feel like that's that's something that I continue to hear this week that about data owners are becoming too isolated. Larry, you're not. So your yeah, look, I think every everybody who owns a, a customer relationship and has first party data needs to be super cautious and protective of that data, no doubt. Um, and I think the regulators are going to force that whether we want to or not. But I think you know we've always been very protective of of our customers' data. However, we recognize that especially in the television ecosystem, it is an ecosystem. And so we have to be collaborative. Right. And so we're constantly looking at how do we partner smarter with our programming partners and our agency and advertising partners in order to unlock the value of the data in a way that is privacy safe, controlled, meets all the restrictions and the criteria for both sides, um, but allows you know, media dollars to flow and better, more relevant experiences for the consumer. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 we've always said it for a number of years about the role of it and the importance of interoperability, but it finally feels like, to your point, that's starting to crack. Because we are right here. I mean, there, it is, we are interoperable at this point. I mean, there, the technology innovations in just the last two years have really enabled that. I mean, you know, we, we work with BlockGraph, which really enables us to do the linking of data without sharing of data. And that's really awesome because now we can do things like audience activation and measurement and you know, all kinds of interesting segmentation that um, in a privacy safe way. So we're, we feel good actually about where the, the regulation and legislation is going. We think it actually plays to a lot of our strengths and our advertiser strengths that have first party data. Right. Well, I think one of the promises of data was less, more, um, decrease of waste, right? And being able to reach consumers um, in a more, um, in a, in a more uh, optimized way. But when was the last time you only shopped at Walmart? When was the last time you only shopped at Walgreens, right? So when the retail marketers are coming in and they say, we have these data sets and these data sets are wonderful and you should use us, how do I know that I'm not just now compounding frequency on the same people because they're not only shopping at one place versus the data sets I have today that allow me to reach them? Yes, they're imperfect. They're not, they not first-party data, they're third-party data, but at loyalty card data I'm talking about specifically, but at least it's from, it's, 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 it's um, deduplicated to, so that I can at least reach a certain amount of people. I pile Walmart data on top of that. How do I not know that I'm not just reaching the same people over and over again? And by the way, now, I think because it's Walmart data, I should send them to Walmart, but that same person is seeing an ad sending them somewhere else, elsewhere in my ecosystem. Yeah. 
it's, uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it, it feels like a lot of maturity finally hitting the market. At the same time though, right, there's, there's more vendor fragmentation than we've seen probably in, in a long time. Again, great options, great solutions. Are you thinking about your strategies from your respective companies? Are, are you thinking in as omni-channel perspective as you can be? I know we always say that, but let's be honest, we also have to execute some of the vision that we have here as well. Or, or are we still kind of in the basis where a lot of our decisioning to be able to answer how to reach the consumer, how to engage the consumer, how to retain the consumer, um, or content providers, we have to think more single channel oriented? In television, you always think about omni-channel. Um, obviously, if you can show ads to somewhere at the top of the funnel, you can follow that up in other places and other times, and, and you can start to map out like what is the natural behavior and the buying cycle and all these kinds of things. Uh, that's, that's absolutely stuff that we will get into, and so we'll supplement our reach, we'll supplement our supply beyond CTV so that it always extends and connects to consumers beyond whether it was the first initial moment and they saw the, the hello of this brand. Um, that, and that's what we see actually drives performance. Uh, if you want to turn CTV into a performance channel, you, you look at it from an omni-channel perspective. So I'm going to challenge that a little bit though, because I, while I agree with you completely, I, I do, um, it's not really the way that the market is going to completely operate in the near term, right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's easy to cross-link planning strategies as it relates to uh, online addressable to CTV addressable, right? Or even the extension into linear addressable. Well, yeah, we but, don't want you but, buying but ads still... from anyone else, like just Roku, <laughs> you know, but, 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 across but, those omni-channels. But in reality, right? <laughs> but in reality though, right? Like the, 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 the folks that are planning linear are thinking right. about very different strategies than the folks that are dealing with digital and so forth. I mean. Do we start seeing that get bridged here in, in 2023? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I, I still see a lot of one slide plans where it's a media flow chart and you have partner, 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 and you have GRPs or impressions or spends by week. Completely wrong slide to look at. It has to start with the consumer, the, the name of this panel, because you have to know who you're targeting. To our conversation earlier, what they're doing, how they're living their lives, it, you have to size up that audience. And only by understanding the audience can you then pick the partners, figure out exactly what it is you need, the nuances of the context within those channels. Because you know, using Roku One, great platform, but what exactly are you buying in that? What are the tactics? What are the formats? The, the times, the days of week, you know, et cetera. You have to figure all that out, and the consumer helps to unlock those sort of insights. And I would, I would even add, at the end, the partners that you pick, they have to work together. You can't pick four partners and four separate platforms that don't know how to talk to one another because then your attribution is going to be confused. You'll never know how each of them is working. They're going to give duplicate credit. And I think at the end of the day, you're never going to be able to, to grade your own homework and then figure out how well the campaign's working. We're going to see so many advancements in incrementality, though, like the application of artificial intelligence against first-party data compared to all of your broad campaign, like scheduling and reporting. Like you can see lift regression on an all, like on an always-on basis, and that's like that stuff is going to start exploding through this time. Um, I would say if you're, if you're doing a, a TikTok campaign, a Roku campaign, and I don't know a Disney campaign, they don't talk to one another. No, I'm saying, I'm saying they don't need to. Like you can start to like apply programmatic and apply algorithmic technologies to the first party data and what is the lift and regression compared to like what started when, how did it run, when did those impressions land, and at what frequency, and you can actually start to map out what was the over under. I think you're just gonna see more and more people move in that direction. Sure. I don't think the tools, though, for the agency really exist to do true cross-platform -pla planning, right? And I think that's, Mike, what you're getting at, which is, you know, how do I have this perfect view of the consumer, but then map them to these various environments that I want to buy and understand the, the intersection of the consumer between them, right? I mean, that, that's the challenge that still exists for us. And I can say on, on behalf of, of, of the Comscore uh, situation that I said, we, we're working hard to try to help you guys and solve that, right? It's, it, there's this absolute challenge, but when we think about our, our own evolution of products, you know, we are thinking about measurement from, from an omni-channel. We are thinking about planning and supporting that from an omni-channel. And frankly, insights and activation that all kind of follow suit with that. Dana, like, but, but to this point though, I mean, are you, I mean, your, your title to me is just, it's, it's fascinating, right? It's experience plus media, right? And I think that that is the fact of starting with the consumer. Most organizations probably don't have, you know, that type of uniqueness of the role, but are you seeing peers in, in market beginning to challenge, uh, challenge their agencies, challenge their, 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 their sell side relationships differently, begin to, to push in this direction? 
Not as much as it should be. Yeah. I think there's still a lot of silos, and I think there's a lot of pockets of goodness, but I think if you don't start with thoroughly, look, in a world where you've got a media discipline and you've got a shopper discipline and you have a consumer promotion discipline, people come into the meeting saying, well, you can't cut my budget because then what am I doing? Right? If you come in saying, we need to meet the consumer where they are, and by the way, we have to also be realistic and say maybe we can't meet the consumer. So hey, I have a problem with consideration. One of the reasons I have a problem with consideration is because my consumers don't feel there's a product that we offer that's good enough for them. Well, that leads to an innovation pipeline, right? But if unless we're asking those critical questions of ourselves to say why aren't we delivering today, you can't you, you can't actually meet your consumers' needs. You're gonna to continue to work in silos. And so I think one of the things that we've, we've done with Havas, and, and by the way, you know, I, I spoke, I'm here with a lot of the Havas folks. We've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in setting Havas up to be our integrated agency team lead. And they've had to stretch beyond being a media partner. They've had to stretch into saying, how do we help lead a comm strategy? How do we work with the creative agencies to make them understand that you can't take television creative and put it in TikTok? How do we work with our shopper folks and help them understand what shoppable media is and that it's not something completely disparate from what we're doing at the top of the funnel, right? And so it's, it's Havas has had to stretch, we've had to stretch, our marketers have had to stretch, but it's the right thing to do because until we start really following the consumer, especially in a fragmented world, because what I would argue is consumers aren't changing, technology is changing, and technology is giving consumers more access. And what I'm excited about, what your question earlier about the boardroom is, there should be the ability with all the new data available for us to actually understand our consumers better and meet their needs better. But we need to be set up organizationally to do that. And yeah. dollars have to be fluid across the entire activation funnel. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, Larry, with all the work that you, know, you guys do with, with uh, the Go Addressable uh, you know, group, I, I feel like there's a, different, there's a different tone that's also coming out of the TV sector as it relates to this, right? That's starting to, to, to really follow directly in line with this. I mean, when you think about where you guys are trying to take, you know, the initiatives as it relates to addressability, you know, is it, it, it really does. It, it starts with a better business model that also ideally is based on helping the, the buy side follow the, uh, the appropriate path of the consumer, right? Well, it's a little bit of what I was mentioning earlier. I mean, it, it really started with collaboration, right? right? I mean, all of the folks that are enabling addressability in the ecosystem really need to understand how they're doing it, do it more the same and less different to make it easier for the buyer, you know, the agency and the marketer to actually access the inventory and have a friction-free workflow um, that ultimately allows you to get the right message in front of that right consumer in a relevant premium television environment. So, I, you know, that's the work that we're doing and it's a, it's a journey, um, but, you know, we're made, we've made great progress and, you know, now we've got many of the programmers kind of actively engaged with us also collaborating within the media group because they're seeing the same challenges. Like, they've each, they've each thought about standing up addressability differently. That creates more havoc for the buyer, right? So we're all now starting to have these conversations about how do we make it simpler and, frankly, break down that siloed effect because we recognize that you know, a buyer wants to buy television. You know, yes, there are discrete you know, pockets of, of folks you wanna buy from or how you wanna deploy budget, but ultimately you want it to work as a single platform. Right. And that's been the kind of the good and bad about television you know, over the last 10 years. It hasn't been a single platform, um, and that was you know, the benefit of Facebook or of an Amazon, because, or Google really, because they were a platform. So one you know, throat to choke, if you will. Totally. You know, and, and to Dana's point about the consumers are changing, technology changed. You know, Peter, your background in mobile, right? You've, you've, you've kind of always operated around a very personal device, but now the TV is becoming a personal device, right? And it's becoming a, a device that, that, is, that is one that is a completely different level of engagement. Yeah, it's a device that we also interact with with our phones. Um, and, you know, we do expect personalized experiences. And, you know, you'll see us invest into more personalized experiences on television for sure. But, you know, going back to this, you know, the, at, at the board level, you know, I, I believe that television's biggest opportunity for monetization is to capitalize both on awareness and on performance. Um, that it's not one or the other. That's challenging because we have generally marketers that are focused on one or the other. 
Um, and I would argue that both sides of the fence should be bleeding toward each other as much as possible. Um, and it's up to you know, you know, us and our customers to figure out how do we measure that and how do we connect. Yeah, we're, we're driving this much GMV, but over the top of that, this is how it's connecting to your holistic omni-channel strategy, and this is the influence it's having sort of outside of our windows, right? Um, so I, I think that that's, that's sort of the biggest opportunity for television. I think one of the challenges, right, are marketers are still creating one asset. Yeah, absolutely. And they're expecting it to do multiple things, right? Like, okay, I created an asset for TV, which is my story, yeah. Yeah. yet now I'm going to measure it on performance, but it didn't have a call to action that was performance. If driven. you give me a brand ad and I put an overlay display unit that says buy now, it will not perform. Right. Like, ever, 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 you know? <laughs> uh, and, and it's super interesting. Like, all the testing we've done shows, like, honestly very common sense results that you need to address the customer, you need to have a call to action, you need to do it early in the spot and probably at the midpoint in the spot. Um, and, and actually, you know, that's sort of counterintuitive to the history of television advertising where that really bristles up some people around, whoa, 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 you want the actors to look at the camera? So faux pas, we're not doing that, it's absolutely ludicrous. But consumers are used to that all day on their phones with influencers, all day across YouTube, right? This is a perfect medium for them to feel like there's an authentic personality that's addressing them directly. It feels more natural. And in fact, I feel like consumers are shifting toward a point where they're like, just sell me and let me know that you're selling me. Don't do this sort of subverted thing that's sort of pretending like you're not selling me while you're selling me. That's hokey, that's ridiculous. So it's just like, tell me, tell me why this is awesome, why it changed your life and why I should buy it now. Uh, and by the way, that's incredible brand adv advocacy over the top of this direct you know, response nature. So, but that's, that's always, I mean, let's be honest, right? Totally agree, that's always been true. Us as consumers, as individuals, right? Take the marketing and the media professional aspect out of what we do on the day to day. We just, we know we're always being sold. But is it yeah, just- Don't lie to me. Is it just more prominent now coming out of COVID because of all of the time that we spent and, you know, the, the perpetuation, the rise of retail media networks now that are following and tracking that. Is it, is it just we're, we're finally there as a consumer base saying, all right, just sell me, but do it, do it in a, a reasonable way or connect the story in, you know, in an addressable way, so, so at least I understand why the things you're giving me or serving me are connected. Is, is, that, is that just a behavior that is now a post-COVID truth that you just look at? I think yeah. there's just been an exponential increase in the number of ad exposures to a consumer across all the different sure. devices and channels that are in that, that format, with, yeah. right. right? And so I think the consumer now is basically just saying, I, I want you to be authentic. Right? Just be authentic and be upfront and tell me because they, they now recognize it. Like before on you know, old TV, it was kind of less obvious, right? But now it's in their face everywhere. So right. now they're like, okay, I want you to be real. But what I, what I think we're missing a lot of times is a really thorough brief. And we've, at Avas, we work really hard with Santa Fe and Dana's team to figure out what are the right questions that the media agency needs to receive. It could be the objective, it could be the measurement sources. It could be the length of time, some of the background of the product, the campaign, the consumers. If we know enough about why we're actually spending the money and who we're going after, you can then figure out how to tailor that specific activation to hit the right notes. And then from an, uh, a measurement standpoint, <clears throat> you have to figure out who, once again, is connected to those media partners. And in CPG, it's getting harder and harder, right? What's the right loyalty panel? How often are they shopping? Some of these products, if they're bought, let's say once a quarter, it may not be the right time to measure enough of a sample size to get a good read. So how do you get enough of the sample? How are they modeling it out? Who are the partners that are actually connected into the ecosystem? And you know, when do you measure it? How much does it cost? All of these are questions that you have to figure out before you even get into any money into, into the market. I, I'm, I might challenge it a little bit in that like, sometimes we're too smart for our own good. And sometimes some, the right influencer that you found online does one take and sends it to you and it crushes all the $250,000 ads you made. Like, it's just so, like, like so, there's something so, like, necessary to, like, let creative, like, leap itself in that way. And, like, sometimes we manufacture, like, a little bit too much and I've seen briefings get in their own way oftentimes versus letting the talent who's passionate about the thing they do, like they talk about beauty products all day, every day, <laughs> they're going to say some cool stuff, you know, and so like getting out of our own way sometimes is, is even more powerful and, and it's certainly cheaper. 
Well, I think, look, I don't want to give away all of our secret sauce, but one of the things that we've been doing with Havas is we said, we would, we would brief, right? And we would brief on a very large segment, you know, segments that are not actually our addressable audiences. They're not actually going to deliver the scale we need in order to deliver our revenue numbers. And so at, we started working very closely with Havas to say, okay, let's start with who we're ultimately going to target. Who are those addressable audiences? Where are we going to source our growth from? And then we took that and we pushed that back up to our insights teams and said, do journey work on these addressable audiences so we can understand the difference between this audience and this audience, who, by the way, are the audiences we're ultimately going to buy. So, you know, I'll take a brand like Gold Bond. If there is an audience of younger consumers who believe that Gold Bond is their mother's brand, the reason they're not buying us is very different than the ones that are price sensitive or the ones that, you know, don't believe that we have, um, that we're as effective, right? And so, to, to the point we were talking about at Roku, yeah, I can use you at the top of the funnel. And by the way, the top of the funnel is really still important to me. I got to bring people into the funnel. But then when I'm using your data sources in the middle of my funnel where I can actually address certain audiences, if I'm not actually tailoring my message to those audiences I've now found, I might as well not have spent the money because I don't need to deliver to some younger audience who thinks Gold Bond's their mother's brand and add about, here, let me give you an opportunity to buy with a discount because that's not going to convince them. Yeah, they also don't feel like you're having a relevant conversation with them. Right. Like, they're like, wait, didn't you just see me do the last 10 things I did? Like, what, why are you trying to do this to me now, you know? And so there's, yeah, it's a very powerful point. Well, there's so one an of the investment in talk- creative, right? I mean, there's an investment in creative that you have to make. If you're going to go down that path of sub-segmentation, you, you, you can't put the single message in front of all of them. It's just not going to work. So, and to your point about using TV, for those audiences of what it's intended, it can be brand, it can also be performance, but you've got to have the right creatives. Yeah. You know, it, it came up a couple of times in kind of the discussion there alluding to the fact of, you know, the, the, the panel's a complete view of the new consumer. There's also a giant new consumer that's starting to take a larger share of purchasing decisions in terms of, I, I always mess it up, but Gen Z, right? The, but the, you know, coming into this age of, of now being a completely different demographic of significant commerce power. Um, and that's going to also change the way not only we measure, but the way that we activate, the way that we think about our, our tech stacks. Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a fascinating time. We, we, have, a, we have a couple minutes left, uh, and you know, I, I, I said backstage, I'm always the person in between food or the bar. Uh, but I did want to ask a question, and I am going to make each one of you answer it. Larry, I'm going to start with you. Crazy couple years. Now we're in an interesting economic state. If you could give yourself advice, pre-COVID, Larry advice today with what you know, what would be one, one thing that you would tell him? Oh, well, I, TV is still going to be awesome, right? I mean, everyone thought TV was dead, right? And that advertising supported television was not going to be a thing. I would have told myself that it was going to be a thing and focus on it and make sure that you've got amazing ad supported products. I love it. Dana? I would say be careful of the headlines and what we think is um, long-standing consumer behavior because there's consumer behavior shifts that happened during COVID that we all doubled down on saying this is the way the consumer is now going to behave and they went back to previous patterns, to pre-COVID patterns. And so I think thinking about things in context to the time and not necessarily saying, okay, everyone has moved to commerce now, retailed is dead, that didn't happen. (laughs) Right. Mike, I would have said sell all of your stocks in mid-22. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, in reality, invest in technology, but don't overinvest. Yeah, to Dana's point, it, it's, there's a fine line of how far consumers are willing to go. Think about retail, double down on store, figure out what's happening with the Walmarts and Kroger's of the world, because they're the ones that consumers ultimately are going to go back to. Uh, yeah, just that... Uh, you know, streaming is actually going to outpace linear, and that's going to be a thing. How do I think about capitalizing on that for the next five to ten years, not for the next year of 2023? How am I going to align my organization to accomplish that? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's coming, and, and it's going to be the, the dominant platform moving forward. How am I going to adapt to it? My own personal one, I would have said, is measurement's hard, but it's probably more critical than ever uh, to help you know, guide our, our investment decisions. So uh, with that, thank you all for being here. Hopefully we solved uh, all your questions as you look into the new year. Thank you very much for attending, uh, and happy CES. Cheers. 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 Cheers.